All right, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on your longitude. Welcome to Mini Wars 2021. We're broadcasting live from Fullerton, California. My name is Jeff Ballard. I am here in Fullerton, along with my cousin, Emily. <clears throat> Emily's waving hello. Um, I wanna uh, welcome you all this morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Mini Wars is put on by the Historical Gaming Society, and we are an educational nonprofit. We teach history by playing games and learning about military history. So, and, and I'd also like to thank our host, Cal State Fullerton, uh, for this beautiful venue. Uh, for those of you who are in California, uh, who would like to come visit us, we are at the Titan Student Union. We will be here today and tomorrow. And the uh, admission is $10 for a single day, $15 for both days. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, for those of us who are on campus, because the, the state of the university is requiring uh, all the on-site participants to, uh, to uh, practice safe COVID guidelines, so you need to wear your masks at all times. And for those of you who are participating online, please mute your microphones. But I would like you to type into the chat, first of all, uh, the city and state where you are currently, and also uh, when the presentation begins or after the presentation begins, there'll be some a Q and A period. So please type your questions into the Q and A box. Um, okay, so before I introduce our special guest today, I have some business that I'd like to take care of. Um, so every year for the last three years, the Historical Miniature Gaming Society has sponsored a student essay contest. So this year we had nine um, entrants that ranged in age from third grade uh, all the way to graduate students. Um, and before I announce the winners, I would like to thank our uh, state slate of judges. I'd like to thank Lou Taylor, who's the editor in chief of the Saber and Scroll Historical Journal. Chris Schlomer, uh, adjunct professor at Northeast Lake View College. Dr. Robert Young, associate professor of the American, at the American Military University. Dr. Elon Mitchell Smith, Associate Professor of Medieval Literature at Long Beach State, Mr. Emiliano Morado from Warlord Games, and Mr. Stephen Fennell of the Historical Miniature Gaming Society. Okay, so the essay contest. There's two divisions, uh, the rising historians for age for elementary, middle, and high schoolers, and then we have a scholarly division who are college baccalaureate and graduate students. So first of all, I'd like to recognize our rising historians. The first is Savannah Booth. Uh, she's a third grader from Fort Belvoir, Virginia. And her uh, uh, essay was entitled Little Errol. Uh, her brother, John, who was a fourth grader, submitted an essay as well. Uh, his essay was titled Alexander the Great, a Great Military Leader. And uh, finally, in the Rising Historians Division, we have uh, Andrew Roth from Chatsworth, Georgia, with an essay entitled, This Day I Conquer or Die, The Battle of Blenheim in 1704. Okay, so now we can get to the scholarly division. Um, I'd like to read this. Um, the, first, uh, the first award we're giving to is an honorable mention to Philip Greer from Brown, Brownsboro, Alabama. His essay was entitled, Greek Hopolite at the Battle of Thermopylae. Congratulations, Philip. The second prize went to uh, Sergeant John Chambliss, United States Marine Corps, for an essay entitled, The Invasion, Invasion at Incheon, The Greatest Turning Point of the Korean War. The first prize went to Mary Jo Davies of Hampstead, North Carolina for her essay titled uh, Greek Warfare from Dark Ages to the Macedonian Takeover. 
And finally, the Tim Keenan Grand Prize winner from Greenwood, Indiana, Gerald Krieger with his essay entitled, The Battle of Lake George. In addition to uh, a, a small uh, scholarship, each one of these uh, articles or each one of the scholarly division articles will be published at the, in the Saber and Scroll, either in the upcoming December issue or in the spring. So congratulations to all of our participants. I hope that you will participate again next year. Please tell your friends, especially you uh, elementary school kids. We'd love to receive more and more uh, essays from you all. Okay, um, so now I'd like to introduce you all to a man who Emily and I have known all of our lives. Now, you certainly know him from his uh, explorations with National Geographic and the discovery of the Titanic. But today, um, we've asked, I've asked him to explain a little bit about how his explorations have changed what it is we think we know about history. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to my uncle, Dr. Robert Ballard. Take it away, Bob. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you very much. And thanks of all of you guys either being there in person or tuning in. I wish I could be there, but uh, we're packing our bag. We're about to uh, uh, take our ship, the Nautilus, which is based in San Pedro, California at this very second, on a journey that will be three to five years in length uh, as we go into the Western and Central Pacific. Uh, uh, but I'll talk about that in a second. I thought I would start with how the heck did I get into the area of maritime history? Uh, my PhD is in geology and geophysics. Uh, and so it's sort of interesting that I would uh, end up doing as many of uh, these expeditions I've done in the past. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go on a PowerPoint and share a screen with you. And let's go to this one, there we go. I, as you can see, wear many hats. Uh, I'm the president of the Ocean Exploration Trust, which owns and operates the EV Nautilus. I'm a professor uh, uh, emeritus at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, uh, where I've been for 30 odd years. And I'm also uh, the, the director of uh, the Center for Ocean Exploration at the University of Rhode Island Graduate School of Oceanography. And then also I am an explorer at large with the National Geographic Society, which I've been working with for 49 years. In fact, most of the uh, expeditions I'm gonna talk about, I've conducted, I think as of last week when I finished my last one, 158 expeditions. I'm 79 years old and Rumors of my death are greatly exaggerated. Uh, before I uh, uh, go into my oceanographic background, I uh, was a combat infantry officer uh, during the Vietnam War. Uh, but before, just as I was heading over there, uh, someone knocked on my door and it was a naval officer because uh, I was in graduate school getting a PhD at USC in uh, marine geology and geophysics. And they thought, why are you in the army? And it turns out I volunteered when I was in the ROTC program at UC Santa Barbara, and they only offered the Army. But uh, my uh, life in the military made a dramatic turn when I ended up as a naval officer, spent 30 years in the Navy and uh, in naval intelligence, and uh, did a lot of things, Some of, one of which I'll be able to talk about today uh, that has been declassified. Uh, but early in my career, uh, here I am reporting for active duty, uh, I spent a tremendous amount of time in both military submarines and uh, uh, non-military submarines. You'll see the one on the left. That's the NR-1, the, the Navy uh, Research uh, Submarine. That's the smallest nuclear submarine that's ever been made. Uh, and I spent about 30 years in and out of that submarine. I've also dove in a large number of deep submersibles. Uh, my favorite being 
uh, the one that was at Wood Soul Oceanographic, where I was for 30 years. I spent about 20 years in this submarine, uh, going up and down like a yo-yo. Uh, back then, that was the only way to get the Mark I eyeball to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, my PhD thesis, uh, using Alvin, dealt with a new emerging theory called plate tectonics. And that uh, insight really began uh, when we saw for the first time uh, what it was like beneath the sea. I think many people think that it's a big bathtub full of mud. Absolutely not. Uh, the largest mountain range on Earth is within the ocean. It runs around the planet like the seam on a baseball, as you can see. Uh, if you put it on an equal area projection, this is a Mercator projection, which distorts high latitude, you'd find out that this mountain range covers 23% of the Earth's total surface area. So it's a vast feature, but most importantly, if you superimpose on this uh, map of the world's ocean, you, uh, all the earthquakes of greater than Richter five over the last 20 years, you'll see that they're not randomly scattered on the surface of the planet. They're actually uh, concentrated along narrow uh, seismic belts uh, that are actually outlining pieces to the Earth. We call them plates. And this was the new theory of plate tectonics, that the Earth is really made up of several large slabs and that these slabs are moving in a orchestrated ballet uh, all over the planet. So this is a synchronized movement of plates where either they're moving apart and that's uh, the mid-ocean ridge, that's where the Earth is bleeding its molten blood. Literally, as you pull the skin of the Earth open, it bleeds its blood, which is uh, molten lava coming up from the asthenosphere, which hardens and then forms new tissue to the planet. And then it moves away from its site of genesis and then can either crash into another plate. That's what we call subduction zones, where great mountain, all the mountain ranges on our planet are made by these collisions of plates on land. But the oceanic plate being heavier than the continental slab descends back inside the earth where it's consumed. So that's the second kind of plate behavior. The third is we're all familiar with the San Andreas Fault, uh, where the uh, uh, Dodgers are, 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 are on, the, uh, on the Pacific plate and the Giants are on the uh, North American plate. Now it's going to be a long time before the, uh, the Dodger-Giant games across town rivalry, but to give you a sense of movement, uh, LA and San Francisco are closing on, on one another uh, uh, roughly your height in your lifetime, about as fast as your fingernails grow. So it is an active surface that's constantly generating uh, uh, earthquakes. Now, if you look at the uh, Earth as a function of its age, the ocean floor, you'll see the mid-ocean ridge in that black line running around, and at the bottom, you'll see zero. That is ground zero on the planet, where there are literally tens of thousands of active volcanoes that are active as we speak, creating new tissue. You'll also notice that the time code uh, you don't see anything older than 280 million, yet we know the Earth is four and a half billion, and that's because the oceanic floor is constantly re-entering the Earth. You'll also notice a difference in the witness width of the colors because the plates are moving at different speeds. With, with plates that have continents on their backs, they tend to move slower than the Pacific plate, for example, that has no continents on its back, moves very rapidly. But no one had actually ever gone down to witness the genesis of the Earth's outer skin and to confirm the theory of plate tectonics. In fact, we, uh, I was in that initial dive team and we didn't go until after the astronauts went to the moon. It's sort of amazing. We went to the moon before we explored the largest feature of our own planet. And here, as uh, we made two major expeditions, one in the Atlantic, where the plates are separating slowly and you have a very large mountain range running down the very axis. And then on the right, you'll see what's called the East Pacific Rise, where the plates are moving much faster. There's much more lava coming out. But this was a, a fascinating uh, uh, talk about rewriting uh, uh, textbooks. Uh, we rewrote the geology book when we uh, confirmed the theory of plate tectonics and threw the old one out. Also, when I was in college, I not only majored in geology, I majored in chemistry. And uh, when I was going to through a chemistry class, we couldn't explain the 
uh, chemistry of the world's oceans. Uh, it had uh, chemicals that did not come in from the rivers and the chemicals that came in from the rivers strangely disappeared. And we couldn't do what we call our mass balance calculations. Well, that was all uh, taken care of when we made another seminal discovery. And that was what we called black smokers. And this was uh, in 1979, I, 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 uh, led an expedition that discovered uh, black smokers. And what you're looking at is really not smoke. Uh, this is uh, very super hot fluids uh, up to 350 degrees uh, centigrade, uh, 650 degrees Fahrenheit pouring out of the bottom of the ocean. And as soon as that hot fluid uh, sees cold water, it quenches. And what you're really looking at are minerals. Uh, this uh, entire uh, chimneys that you're looking at are called polymetallic sulfides. They're made up of copper, lead, silver, zinc, and gold in commercial concentrations, which has launched an entire uh, new view of the world's ocean's chemistry and is opening up Pam Doris box to deep sea mining, which is right on the horizon. Uh, are living around these black smokers. So we rewrote the chemistry book for that discovery. Well, then we rewrote the biology book when we discovered these exotic creatures characterized by, by giant worms 13 feet tall and, and clams that had human-like blood in them. Uh, and we all know uh, from our biology book that life on our planet is due to photosynthesis, that the photons coming off the uh, uh, reactors of the, of the sun uh, travel through space at the speed of light, come into our atmosphere, captured by uh, uh, plants and fixed chlorophyll, and in so doing, fixed carbon. And therefore, we thought that was the basis of the food chain. Yet this ecosystem lives totally independent of the sun. And in fact, if you look at this horrible looking clam and you cut it open, it has no uh, internal organs. It's in, fire, in fact, its entire body has been taken over by that very odd looking, what we call uh, Archean bacteria, very primitive bacterium that lives inside their body and has convinced them and, and the tube worms to ingest poisonous hydrogen sulfide gas that then replicate photosynthesis in the dark through a process we now call chemosynthesis. So that's sort of my background. But after making all these discoveries and exploring them in deep sea submersibles, I went off. Uh, uh, I, I, my problem was getting to work. When I make a dive to 20,000 feet, uh, it takes uh, six hours to get to 20,000 feet, it takes six hours to get home. It means my commute to work uh, back and forth is 12 hours, which leaves little time at the office. So when I make super deep dives, I'm down there for just minutes, at best an hour or so. So I went off to, uh, to Stanford and I began uh, thinking about what I was gonna do for the rest of my life. Was I gonna spend it going up and down on an elevator? And this was at the time, 1979, 1980, when Silicon Valley was exploding with microprocessors, digital imagery, fiber optics, and all of that technology. And I'm dyslexic, so I tend to visualize things in my mind and I'm sitting there and I began to visualize a new way of going to work. And I published it in the December 1981 issue of National Geographic, and I called it telepresence. And the concept behind telepresence was not to move my body, uh, but to move my spirit, to literally have beam me down Scotty, and to be able to develop robots that were my surrogates, robots that took my place, carried my eyes, carried my ears, carried my hands. But uh, ultimately, I wouldn't even have to be on the ship. So I published this cartoon. But then I returned to my laboratory and with my uh, uh, team at, from MIT and Woods Hall, we took my cartoon and turned it into a, an engineering plan to develop uh, what we call the Argo Jason system to be able to place a robot down and not come up. So the whole time uh, we wanted to focus on exploration is all about bottom time in our business. So we deploy our vehicles and we do not bring them up. And not only do we deploy them and operate them from the ship through a satellite link, uh, we can send it ashore. So that was our initial plan. And so then I went to the National Science Foundation and said, what do you think? And they said, not interested. So I went to my colleagues in the Navy because I was an active duty a reserve officer at the time. 
And I went to a particular individual named Admiral Ron Thunman, who was the chief of Naval Operations for Submarine Warfare, Vice Admiral Thunman, uh, was a Rickover guy. And I said, what do you think? We're taking humans out of the battlefield. And they said, let's do it. So I had uh, an agenda in my mind, uh, and that was to use my technology to go off Woods Hole, where I was living, to find the Titanic. Well, that was not the Admiral's plan. So when I spoke to the Admiral about this plan, he said, look, I'll fund it, but you have to do something for me. So it became a tale of two stories. My story, my desire to find the RMS Titanic and the Navy's desire to explore, uh, explore two submarines we lost during the Cold War. One was the Thresher, uh, which we had a pretty good idea what happened to the Thresher as, after it came out of the shipyard in, in, in Portsmouth, Maine, went out to recertify itself. And one of the high, high, well, high pressure welds uh, burst can, the water came in at such pressure, it atomized, shorted out the electrical bus uh, of the submarine and the submarine a nuclear reactor went into full scram. And while they were trying to reboot the nuclear reactor, they were blowing ballast, but it, uh, there was a fine grade screen over it. It froze and they, they sunk below collapse depth and imploded. Uh, so we knew pretty much the story about them, but we were interested in what was happening to their nuclear reactor because we were thinking of disposing of nuclear reactor containment vessels in the ocean, and we wanted to know what they do to the environment. The second one was the Scorpion, which was a whole nother kettle of fish. The Scorpion had been on war patrol in the, in, in the Mediterranean. As it came out, it was redirected to a Warsaw Pact exercise off of the Canary Islands and then reported that it was coming home, uh, would be uh, standing down from, from its war configuration, and it never showed up. Uh, we did uh, hear it uh, implode through our, at that time, classified SOSIS uh, uh, system, and we knew where it was. Unfortunately, the Soviets did not know where it was because the Scorpion was carrying nuclear weapons. So my job was to, uh, explore that wreck as well, determine the, uh, the nature of the reactor's in, in impact on the environment, but more importantly, uh, penetrate into the forward torpedo room to determine the status of the nuclear reactors and to 100 per, um, nuclear weapons uh, and uh, torpedoes, and then to be able to uh, do complete characterization of it so we could uh, try to understand what caused its demise. So that was story number one. Uh, so my job was to go to both of those submarines, completely map them, and then prepare myself for phase two, which was to penetrate inside of them. Uh, this is the only reason I'm talking to you about finding the Titanic is because the Titanic was situated between the two submarines. So I was able actually through President Reagan and Secretary Lehman get permission to do the Scorpion. We'd already done the Thresher the year before in 1984, but in 1985, my, uh, my ship was based in, in the Azores. And instead of going directly to the Titanic, I first went to the Scorpion because I needed to do that mission. And then I was released uh, from the, I had three intelligence officers embedded in my team. And one of them, uh, Lieutenant Commander uh, George Ray, was the one that was going to give me the green light that I'd finished my job and release me to uh, go after the Titanic. But I, I took a lot of time on the Scorpion. I only had 12 days to find the Titanic, so I had to get clever and re uh, creative. But it was really uh, the uh, sinking uh, uh, exploration of the Thresher and Scorpion that told me how to find the Titanic. If you want to know more, get my book, Into the Deep. It was just published by National Geographic, and I go into this in much greater detail than I can do now. Um, but it was uh, finding the debris trail that was far longer than the length of the ship and following that debris trail until we came across the boilers of the Titanic that morning of September 1st, uh, almost at the same time she sank at uh, 2 in the morning and then found the ship itself. That really launched my career into maritime history. I had never done anything like that before, but I was really amazed at the state of preservation. 
Yes, the ship had been torn apart, but you could go down, as you can see, and still see the anti-fouling paint painted on the hull. You could read first class entrance. It was a museum of the deep. And that's what I'm now uh, discovering is that, that the ocean has more history in it than all the museums of the world combined. But in this particular mission, my mission was to return to the ship and penetrate inside, which I did, and then go on to do my secondary mission with the Scorpion. So this really began, like I say, about a 25 year history of, of, of looking at maritime history uh, sponsored by the National Geographic Society. Uh, one of my earlier ones was actually uh, shortly after finding the Titanic was uh, the uh, to explore the USS Scorp uh, 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 Scourge and the USS Hamilton, uh, which were two ships that were confiscated. Uh, they were Canadian merchant ships that were confiscated during the war and pressed into service, loaded down heavily on the deck uh, with, with uh, uh, cannons, which led to their demise. Uh, when prior to the battle they were going to have with the British in Lake Ontario, uh, the uh, a wind came up, a strong wind came up and literally flipped the ships. And then on the way down, they righted themselves. But again, unbelievable state of preservation uh, because uh, in uh, freshwater, you don't have wood boring organisms. Uh, here is a quite an amazing image of the sabers at the ready and the figureheads of the ships. And you'll see a young boy who I actually connected by way of satellite so that a child could uh, explore it from, from shore. We're now, uh, we just did that again, just for the first time since 1991, just last week. Uh, we, we again uh, did complete teleoperated control from shore. So that was a fascinating uh, expedition uh, uh, during the war of 1812. Uh, then I uh, was commissioned by National Geographic to to do a, a major series of expeditions uh, uh, in the Battle of Gallipoli at the entrance to the Dardanelles. So as you know, this was commonly referred to as Churchill's folly as he was attempting to open up a second front uh, with, with the Germans uh, 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 during World War I. Uh, uh, and he ran into the Ottoman Empire, which was a tragic lesson. I always, uh, uh, enjoyed the names the British picked for their ships, uh, particularly the ones that sank, <laughs> the indomitable, the inflexible, and the incompatible. As you know, this uh, the initial campaign uh, was uh, a naive thought that they could assemble their battleships, steam up the Dardanelles and take Turkey, and then uh, close in from behind into the, uh, into the Black Sea. Uh, the person watching them from the cliff was a naval officer of the Ottoman Navy at the time named Ataturk, who, who as you know, was the unifying person, uh, unifying Turkey. And he watched them practice. He noticed how they turned after they practiced. He laid in mines and did devastating damage to them, causing Churchill to back off and uh, uh, but we, our job uh, back was to go and find as many of those ships as we could and document them for National Geographic, uh, which was in a, a wonderful program that you can get online. Following this disaster in the Dardanelles, Churchill ordered a land assault on the Gallipoli uh, Peninsula that proved equally fatal. It was uh, Anzac, Australian and New Zealand infantry soldiers were slaughtered as they stormed ashore. Uh, and uh, we went off of Anzac after doing the Battle of Gallipoli, and we were uh, searching for and successfully located the uh, HMS Triumph, which was a, sh a ship also sunk, but during that campaign, you can see it in the lower left on our side scan sonar, as well as other ships that were sunk in that engagement. But it's always interesting uh, when you go uh, anywhere in the world that's never been explored before, you bump into other things. Not only did we find the warships and the uh, that were sunk during that campaign and the lifeboat you'll see there in the center up upper center, we came across fascinating circular features that we believe were made thousands of years ago when this was dry land and populated by humans. So it took us much further back than we had planned. And uh, this is a fascinating a story that uh, again, we've published in, in, in various uh, articles with National Geographic. 
But during that campaign, as you know, the Titanic had, a sis had two sisters, uh, the Olympic, which uh, uh, preceded the Titanic, made 500 successful crossings back and forth across the North Atlantic. And there was this, the, the third sister was renamed. Or, uh, she was originally thought they were going to call her the Titanic, Olympic, and Gigantic. Uh, but as the war broke out, they renamed her the RMS Britannic. And she was to, uh, pressed into service as a hospital ship and on her way down to Gallipoli, passing through a narrow strait off the Greek island of Kia, uh, encountered a, uh, a minefield that the Germans had placed in her path, struck a mine on her port side and sank to the bottom. We did a TV special with PBS on that program as well. Uh, again, then National Geographic wanted me to uh, take on another mystery, uh, uh, which was the sinking of the Lusitania. We all know where she sank off the old head of Kinsale. Uh, we pretty much knew where she was, although it was really funny when I went to, I did have the exact coordinates of where she sank. We just knew she sank in sight of the old head of Kinsale. I went down to the fishermen. It's always interesting to get the local lore. And I asked them where the Lusitania was. And they said, they gave me the coordinates. They said, it's where we're losing all our fishing nets. So it was uh, our mission was to determine the, the actual cause of her sinking. Uh, there was some debate as to what caused that sinking. In the case of the Lusitania, the, the Germans proudly claimed for uh, uh, sinking it, but they said they only fired one torpedo and that that torpedo uh, led to a, a second and much more massive explosion. And they blamed it on uh, illegal war material that was stored above the, uh, aboard the Lusitania. They had spies uh, when they were uh, loading her out in New York for her crossing. And it turns out that in fact, she was carrying war material, but they were, there was nothing explosive. They were cartridges uh, and what are, uh, that could not ignite. So our job was to try to understand what was that second explosion. And because of the way she was laying on her side, if there were any war materials, they would have been stored in her forward magazine. So we went down with our various vehicle systems and were able to get in underneath the ship. We had, we made a three-dimensional map of the ship with our mapping system. We then superimposed the, uh, the drawings of the ship to tell us exactly where the magazine was. We were able to go underneath and the magazine was completely intact. But what we did see, if we go back to that picture of, you'll see where she took that torpedo hit on her starboard side, a beam of the bridge, we know that this was where the coal bunkers were. Uh, when they were coaling the ships of this type, uh, they would come right up to the side of the ship. They didn't want to pass all the coal through the ship. And they would open uh, compartments on, 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 the, on the starboard side and port side of the, of the ship and load it with, uh, with coal. Uh, that coal bunker uh, was right where that impact took place. We know that uh, when she was nearing the old head of Kinsale on her way to Liverpool, that she was, her coal bunkers were largely empty, but we had these massive rooms, uh, bunkers, uh, very hot right next to the boilers and a tremendous amount of coal dust. And we were able to sample uh, because where they, when it hit the, the Lusitania, the coal, uh, remaining coal fell on the ground of the ocean, ocean floor, we were able to pick up that material and we had it analyzed as bituminous coal, which is highly explosive. So our conclusion was that the torpedo hit the warm coal bunker, put the coal up into the air of the bunker and ignited it, causing that much more massive explosion. So, Naturally, after the, finding the Titanic, uh, Geographic wanted me to go on, and that was our expedition to find the, the German battleship Bismarck. Uh, it turned out to be a rather uh, a difficult task because the search area was, was very large. And that's because, uh, you know, in a running sea battle, the last thing people do is, uh, let me get my, I'm trying to get this so I can see what's coming up. There we go. Uh, in a running sea battle, the last thing you write down is latitude and longitude. It's all about range and bearing. 
And so the area was much larger than the Titanic. It was also in a complex terrain. There was a big volcano covered it with sediments. And, uh, and, and we had very poor uh, guess on where she was. The last remaining ship was the Dorsetshire, which put the coup de grace uh, and sank her. And they had a position. It turns out that position was wrong. Uh, it's very common in most of my searches that the, where they think it is, it, it was not. But we then were able to uh, search and find a similar debris field, follow that debris field into the impact. Uh, it turned out where the Bismarck impacted, uh, it landed on the side of a, a snow covered, so to speak, sediment covered mountain and set up a massive avalanche. And we followed that avalanche down until we found the ship seen here, uh, upright and uh, intact. Uh, with barrel uh, guns at the ready, our first image really uh, coming in on it was a, a, a gun barrel coming out of nowhere. It was really quite amazing thing that uh, the first thing we saw was a gun barrel pointed straight at us. And then we realized we'd better raise quickly or we were gonna hit the bridge. Uh, another one that was really interesting with National Geographic was called Operation Drumbeat. And this was, as you know, following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, Hitler declared war on America and launched his long uh, uh, distant submarines that could get uh, over to, uh, from Germany to America. And then he set up a area out in the Central Pacific, Central, Central North Atlantic, were the, the, what were they called the cows, the large uh, submarines that could fuel the other submarines and, and because they couldn't be reached by uh, our aircraft. So it was a, an area where ships, uh, submarines could surface and refuel. And this was a massive amount of damage done in the early months of World War II uh, before we had really developed the techniques for, for convoys. And it was uh, the, the Germans referred to it as the happy time uh, because as you know, uh, by the time the war ended, they'd lost 90% of their crews. And, but in the beginning of the war, they were losing none. So they did refer to it as the happy time as they were able to just uh, attack our unprotected ships as they were coming on their way to England. Uh, the one of particular interest was, uh, was a story about uh, during Operation Drumbeat about a, a liner, uh, the Robert E. Lee, which was carrying survivors uh, back initially to Tampa, got redirected to New Orleans, uh, and it was being escorted by a patrol boat, PC-566, under the command of Lieutenant Commander Herbert uh, Claudice. Uh, and he had very no combat experience. And uh, the uh, German U-boat uh, 166 uh, spotted the, the Robert E. Lee, sank it, and while admiring its, uh, its kill it, with, its, uh, uh, with its periscope still up, uh, the uh, uh, PC-566 began a depth charge run on it, uh, dropping on depth charges, but it was in the uh, same area where the Robert E. Lee had sank, so there was a lot of debris and oil in the water, but the captain claimed the kill. Uh, but then an investigation was carried out where they concluded it was impossible for him to have killed, uh, uh, sank the submarine uh, because it was at periscope depth and his, his depth charges were all set to, to explode at much deeper depth. Uh, so he was uh, relieved of his command and he was sent back to school to learn how to sink subs. Uh, and he, he died uh, never being given credit for the kill. Uh, and it wasn't until 2001 uh, two petroleum companies, uh, BP and Shell, were uh, surveying uh, uh, an area for a pipeline. They came across with their sonar uh, uh, this image, which turned out to be the remains of 166, right near within a mile of the Robert E. Lee. So our expedition was to conduct a detailed survey of uh, U-166, and we encountered an interesting uh, uh, situation. We found that the bow section and the stern section, so you see up in the upper left and, and lower left and lower right, you'll see the, the bow section of U-166, but in the upper right, you'll see the, the, the actual bow section where the torpedo room was. You'll see that uh, 
they're very far apart. Uh, and it was a massive explosion, which a depth charge cannot do. So something had happened that had nothing to do with that single depth charge. So we were able to go down and do a very detailed analysis of it. And we came to the conclusion that when they, uh, uh, when they dropped their depth charges, one of them literally landed on the deck of U-166 in its crash drive, dive and rolled down the deck and came to rest directly above the torpedo room. And that when it did finally reach the de depth that it was set to explode, went off, and then with a massive secondary explosion, blew off the entire bow. Turned out that the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral John Greener and I had sailed together. I was a, he was an engineering officer on the uh, NR1 when I was a commander and we spent a lot of time together underwater. And I called him and I said, John, I think this guy got the shaft and that you should, you should really do a detailed uh, a, a rethinking of what happened that fateful day. Uh, we were able to track down his older uh, his oldest son Herbert Jr. and who was living on the West Coast. We in, uh, we invited him to uh, the Pentagon. You can see him with uh, Admiral John Greenert uh, as uh, just after uh, the Secretary of the Navy Raymond uh, uh, Mabus uh, gave of him the uh, Legion of Merit. And I can tell you, we filmed it. You can watch it. There wasn't a dry eye in the room. <laughs> the next big campaign I did with National Geographic was to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Guadalcanal. And the Battle of Guadalcanal occurred early in the war, uh, uh, beginning uh, in uh, uh, August of uh, 7, uh, 1942. Uh, I was a few months old when this took place. Uh, this was when Japan could not be stopped. After attacking us at Pearl Harbor, the, the rising sun began to sweep across the Pacific. And at, at, by the time it got to right after the Coral Sea, which was in May, when we were able to check, as you know, check the uh, uh, attack of uh, expansion of, of Russia, I mean, of, of the Japanese uh, uh, Navy. Uh, but in August of, of 42, uh, we wanted uh, to, uh, to deal with the problem. And that was, as you know, after uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, the Japanese uh, attacked uh, the Philippines, MacArthur retreated to the island of Corregidor and then uh, left in a submarine uh, with the Japan in hot pursuit. The plan was for, uh, for Japan to ultimately invade Australia. Uh, and to do that, they wanted to cut off its supply line uh, to to the west, to to America, to Pearl Harbor, and they began building an airstrip on a tiny island in the Solomon Islands called Guadalcanal. And clearly, we could not let that happen. So the result became known as the Battle of Guadalcanal, which lasted for six months, seven major naval battles, numerous clashes ashore, and continuous air combat. I focused, in, when the dust settled on all of this, uh, there was uh, 52 warships had gone to the bottom in Iron Bottom Sound. Uh, as you know, the first one, the Battle of Savo Island was the biggest uh, naval defeat in American history. Uh, but we finally scored, uh, we finally began to turn the tide and push the Japanese out of, of Guadalcanal and secured that area as we began. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the rising sun began to set as we were pushing them northeast up the slot towards Rabaul. And we were able to go in and locate 14 of those warships uh, in Iron Bottom Sound. There's been subsequent expeditions that have found uh, other ones. But as, as you can imagine, many of the ships were not where they thought they were. So we were able to finally nail them to the ground and get their precise locations. We continued up the slot a year or so later uh, to take on another, uh, what turned out to be a true ne needle in the haystack. And that was to find President Kennedy's PT-109. 
uh, off of uh, Blackett Strait uh, in the slot. And as you know, they were trying to intercept the, the Japanese owned the, the night and we owned the day because we had air cover, they did not. And they uh, had what we call the Tokyo Express, which would come down from Rabaul and supply their, their forces in the field. Uh, and we uh, wanted to intercept the Tokyo Express in the narrow uh, gap that you can see there uh, between uh, uh, the uh, volcanic island of Kolombara and the uh, area of Gizo on the on the south side of the slot. So this is where Kennedy and his 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 uh, other uh, uh, other PT boats set up camp that fateful night. Uh, when out of the darkness came a Japanese destroyer that was trained to when you see a PT boat run it over, and it did. Now, historians wrote down that PT-109 was split in half and that uh, the, the, the uh, stern sank at the point of collision. And there was a coast watcher that observed that collision and thought it was a successful kill by the PT boats. But in fact, it was the explosion of, of uh, PT-109. So from his logs, we were able to get a pretty good range and bearing, most importantly, a bearing because we knew where he sat. And so we naturally set up camp to where the historian said the uh, stern of the PT boat would be located. And there was nothing there. Uh, so this then led to an interesting encounter I had. That's Max Kennedy, who came along representing the Kennedy family. We came along and we actually tracked down the two native uh, who had found Kennedy and rescued them. This I find quite um, amazing. Here are these two people sitting on a bench, still alive, and with, with no modern medicine, and they're still there. And most of the people uh, who participated in that campaign and survived weren't, had now passed away. So I don't know about the, the marvels of modern medicine. These guys were do doing rather well without it. But it was with them, I was able to sit down with an interpreter and, and talk with them. And what I found was the, the, uh, the historians had said that the bow had actually floated ashore, rotted, and was gone. And so if we couldn't find the stern and the bow wasn't there, this was really turning into a very difficult task. But then when talking to the natives, they said, no, no, that wasn't the bow of PT-109. We went over to it, it was full of Japanese rifles. And so I said, well, wait a minute, if that's the case, as you can see in that lower right, I recalculated. I said, let's, let's assume the boat was damaged, but not, it was intact. And that what we saw drifting the next morning was the entire PT boat. So I began calculating the currents and drifts and, and I predicted that the wreckage would be found where you see that blue uh, cross. And that's exactly where it was. So that was, again, just like I talked to the fishermen in, 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 uh, in Ireland, talking to the natives, locals, you know, don't, don't forget those locals because they really can give you information that uh, historians never seem to get. Then we did the Battle of, York, uh, Battle of Midway, which as you know, was the battle we should have never won. Uh, it was, uh, uh, we, we, we had just, uh, carried out the Battle of Coral Sea, the Yorktown limp back to Pearl. Nimitz said, you know, how, how long is it going to take you to put it back into duty? And he's, they said many months, and he said, yeah, th three days. And you know the story of interpreting their messages, cracking their code, and then hearing about some island that they then sent a message in, that they had a code name for, they sent a mess, the US sent a, a message, open message, that they knew the Japanese would intercept. And they said, we're, we're having water problems, water shortage on the island. And then the Japanese sent out a message to their fleet uh, th that the island that, that, that they were using a code name for had a water problem. So we knew it was, it was Midway that they were going to attack. And the thing about Midway was an aircraft carrier you couldn't sink. 
And so this was a uh, this was a, an amazing turn of events. Many people uh, feel it was the the turning point in the war of the Pacific when we sank the Japanese carriers that attacked us at Pearl Harbor. And not only did they lose their carriers, they lost their samurai. Uh, they lost their samurai pilots. Their pilots were literally samurais. In many cases, took their sword with them into the cockpit, and it took a tremendous amount of time to make. They were great pilots. They, uh, they, they were slaughtering us during the Battle of Midway until we luckily came out of the clouds with the dive bombers and, and sank their carriers. And then the aircraft had to ditch and they lost their great pilots. And this was what led to the kamikaze pilot because they couldn't make them uh, train them as fast as we could. And that was a, a critical loss in the war to the Japanese. It was a, definitely a needle in the head. It was a very large search area. And I couldn't use my conventional search techniques, which was to tow a deep toed side scan sonar. Uh, once you put a, a deep toed side scan sonar down to 17,000 feet and try to get underway, the drag on your cable is so immense that you can only creep along at less than a knot and you only see a swath width of 1500 meters. It's like mowing the lawn, you're mowing the grass and your blades are 1500 meters wide. And you couldn't mow the lawn in time, given the money that Geographic gave me. So I really rolled the dice on this one. I picked a sonar called the MR1 that had a 14 kilometer swath width. So much massive swath width, but it was such a low frequency. And in the game of sonars, it's range versus resolution. Higher the, uh, the, re the, the frequency, the better the resolution, uh, but the lower the frequency, you get a much larger range, uh, but you can't detect much. So when I did the math on this sonar, it said that I would, the Yorktown, if it was intact, and if I ran parallel to it would be uh, seven pixels, which is just enough to detect. That's the size of a rice grain. And so I, and it, I had to run parallel. So I ran my lines uh, in both parallel, both north, south, and east, west. And I picked up that rice grain, went down, and we were able to find the, uh, the Yorktown sitting upright on the bottom. And that was a successful mission as well. Before I uh, go, uh, finish up with this, I wanted to say that th th I continued my quest even further back into time. I got hooked on, on the human history beneath the sea, going back, uh, in this case, trying to prove that the ancient mariner, the scholars said the ancient mariners hugged the shoreline. It made no sense to me. Why would you, if you were a, a businessman with, with selling wine to Rome and from Carthage, which became the breadbasket of Rome after the Punic Wars, when the Carthaginians were vanished, vanquished off, of, of, off Tropani, Sicily, uh, why would you go along the coastline to Morocco, across Gibraltar, you would go straight line. This was my most sophisticated search I'd ever done. I made a, I drew a straight line and said, it's on that line. And I was able to, uh, to uh, find what I was looking for. I think it's time, Jeff. Uh, I think you'd like me to go into the Q&A phase. Is that true? Yes, I would very much. Uh, so, uh, everybody who is online, if you have any questions, why don't you type them into the uh, yep. chat box? And Bob, I have one that I wanted to start you out with. Um, so when I was doing research for an article that I wrote on PG-109, I, I learned that the, the Navy was conducting offensive mining operations in Blackett Strait in 1943. I think it was March 1943. Was, was there any concern that not all the mines had been swept? Well, there's always those concerns. By the way, we did find a Japanese destroyer not far from, uh, uh, from PT-109 and met its fate on a mine. Uh, yes, I have. Uh, my first encounter were contact uh, depth charges on the Lusitania. Uh, this is in World War I. They, they used, it was like, you remember the guy dropping a bomb out of a, biplane. Uh, this was a contact bomb that you dropped and then would hit and uh, detonate. And I can remember I was down in a submarine 
and I could see that those unexploded with their detonator. And I, that was nervous because I really I don't bump up against one of those. But I think in many cases, the mines uh, were cabled uh, and they tend to corrode and rot because the, the power of buoyancy never goes away. So the stress on the cable never goes away. And as you weaken it and weaken it, it finally, and then it floats to the surface and goes to shore. Great. Uh, so we have a question from Sarah in San Diego, uh, California. How do you treat human remains that you find when you conduct these searches? Well, that's a tough one, Jeff. Uh, obviously, uh, my... My orders from my commanding officer on the Thresher and Scorpion, particularly when we were going inside, uh, if you find human remains, it's it's you don't photograph, uh, and it was classified top secret if we found any human remains in the deep sea, and certainly in the Titanic is a classic example, as was the Bismarck. Bodies are quickly found by organisms. And they're eaten just as if someone drops dead in the forest, uh, the animals will eat the person and expose the skeleton. It turns out in the deep sea, uh, you, uh, where we were working, you pass through what's called the calcium carbonate compensation depth and it dissolves bones. If you go to our nautiluslive.org website, you'll see whale falls where whales have fallen to the ocean floor and we, we get really good time sequences. It takes about seven years to dissolve a skeleton uh, in the deep sea, but what's left behind are the inorganics, in particular leather shoes. Uh, leather is treated with tannic acid and wood boring organisms and other scavengers will not eat, uh, 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 eat, eat boots. It's sort of that classic old picture of a guy going fishing and bringing up a boot. Uh, we found all around the Titanic pairs of shoes where the body had landed. Uh, but in one, uh, one recent case, and it's, it's again in my book, Into the Deep, I got a phone call when Syria shot down uh, a, a Turkish Phantom jet uh, off the uh, north uh, west corner, right on the border between Turkey and Syria, uh, was shot down and I was called in to find that jet uh, and recover the bodies. Uh, and they were, they were fresh. So they, they were only days old. So in those cases, uh, we did recover the bodies and returned them home for burial, uh, and again, presented them to their families. So if they're, if they, if it just happens, uh, the bodies will be long. But if you look, for example, at Amelia Earhart, which as you know, we did round one, we're going after her again next, uh, in early 2023, when we're in off Allen. Uh, you know, the, the Malaysian Airlines, uh, they, the, all the bodies will be gone by now. Now, if it's deep inside, and if you get deep, penetrate deep inside a, a ship like the, uh, like the Titanic, if you went into the engine, if you could get into the engine room of the Titanic, there's a high probability the bodies are all there because uh, it would go anoxic. Uh, once you, any sort of back, uh, decay leads to anoxia. Uh, I had a image, I had an image. Let me, let me go back and share an image for this question. I'm gonna go back to an image I was just, let me go back, where is it? Let me share this. Uh, so you can see that, oops, for some reason, I'm not going backwards. He's a Nautilus. Yeah, I want to share it. Okay, is this the new? No, I want to share. You are sharing your screen, mm -hmm. but I'm not. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, I see. I see the Nautilus. Yeah, um, for some reason. Oh, there we go. I got it back. Let me close this. In the Black Sea. In the Black Sea, there's no oxygen. So I here, if you look at the lower right, you'll because there's no oxygen, it goes anoxic, and there's no organisms to eat them. Uh, you'll see human remains, and those human remains are on a ship that sank 350 BC. 350 mm. BC, and if you look at the other artifacts in the wood, look at the lower left. That looks like that amphora was made yesterday. 
and it still has its beeswax dripping down, running down the side. That, that went down 2000 years ago. So uh, I have another shot. I just didn't have time to share with you where I was working off of the Crimea, found a, a, a Soviet helicopter, perfectly preserved with, with the pilot and co-pilot still aboard. Ooh, I did not know that. <clears throat> so um, let me go back to unshare. <laughs> Stop sharing. There we go. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have a question from Jerry Krieger, who's actually in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> well, hello there. Yeah. I want to work in the. I want to work in the Red Sea. <laughs> so let me get his question here. He said, "You've had such an amazing career. Thank you for your time. Can you share a story about a ship that you couldn't locate?" Well, I got them all uh, that I went after. Uh, it may have taken them more than once. You know, I just don't give up. Clearly, Amelia Earhart is still in my crosshairs, but that's not a ship. But uh, that that's the next one in our in our periscope. Uh, yeah, there's lots. I mean, clearly, I'd love to spend more time in the Black Sea. I'd love to spend more time in, in, in ancient antiquity because the, the, they estimate that there are 3 million shipwrecks, the United Nations best estimate, and many from ancient antiquity. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, when you figure how long, you know, ancient history has been around a lot longer than fairly recent history. So the, the, the loss, uh, they had some, somewhat of a Lloyd's of London back in Roman time, uh, and the, the, the tens of thousands of ships were lost. And so think of all those time capsules of human history, uh, lost chapters. It's one thing to find a, a chapter you've read that slut needs to be rewritten, but it's a, much more exciting to find a chapter that's never been written. And so I would, the Red Sea, imagine what's in the Red Sea. It's been there for 5 million years. It's fairly new ocean broke off from uh, Africa, but the, but the Red Sea, oh my gosh, it's got to have a massive amount of ancient history. Uh, I'd love to get in there. Wonderful. Well, can you tell me what is the Nautilus going to be doing in the next couple of years? We're going to boldly go where no one has gone before. <laughs> uh, uh, let me go back to my share screen and let's get to that. And let's quickly blast through. Uh, let me see again. I'm sort of, I keep having, let's see, it's this, you are screen sharing. It's funny how it lets me in and doesn't let me in. Oh, you're, oh there we go. Okay, let's go fast forward to that. That's America. We own more land under the ocean than any other nation on earth. And we have better maps of Mars than half the United States. Isn't that ridiculous? What the heck? Mars is, there's no plan B for the human race. We're stuck here. And so we better learn what we, what we have. And the oceans are gonna be critical to the survival of the human race, particularly for feeding us and resource wise. And this area is ours. And so we've been commissioned by our country to mount the second Lewis and Clark expedition. But since 55% of my Corps are women, we call it the Lewis and Clark expedition. And our ship is getting ready as we speak. If you go to nautiluslive.org, you can follow us in our explorations of America starting in four days. We set sail and we're heading across to Hawaii to the largest monument ever made in the world. It's, it stretches from the Big Island all the way to uh, Midway. Uh, and we work based ourselves out of Midway for a while. But all of that area we own and we don't know what we own. So that's our, we have a 10 year grant to change that. So stay tuned, nautiluslive.org. Okay, I've got one last question here for you. Uh, do you see where there is an, an increase in the application of hard science to explore historical human mysteries? Yeah, I think I think uh, I've it's been an interesting 
encounter between the physical sciences and the social sciences. Uh, it's not been a, 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 a always smooth. Uh, I think there's, 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 you know, we tend to be very mathematically based. We tend to, you know, it's sort of the similar issue you're having between people doing DNA research in the medical profession where you're, you're looking at something with a totally different lens and you, you also have the lens. I think we, because we're oceanographers, a typical expedition uh, like the ones I'm mounting, uh, they're $60,000 a day. I mean, you, you burn a million plus in a month, but we're funded to do that because we're funded by the Department of Defense in particular. Uh, we're funded by uh, industries that are looking at commercial benefits and all of that. So there's a much larger economic engine behind what we do than an archaeologist can get. So the, the resource, they're very, you're resource strapped. We're not. And it's trying to develop a respectful relationship. And we've not had that with the social sciences. Uh, they treat us like technicians, even though we all went to MIT and <laughs> treat us like we're, 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 we're just technicians that all, oh, by the way, raised all the money to do it. So yeah, there's a, this project archeology span ethos of standing above the, the tombs of Egypt and while the slaves shovel and do it is, is, is an unhealthy attitude that has led to us just stop doing it. I left, I just said, I've, you know, quite honestly, I've had enough of it. Uh, so I, I, I could have stayed there and chose to leave. Well, I cannot thank you enough for your time today. This has been fascinating. I'm sure everybody online feels the same way that I do about all the things that you've done. Um, and I'm, you know, particularly like you said, uh, there was not a, a dry eye in the house when uh, Commander Claudius received his Legion of Merit. And I, I feel the very same way. I think that is why we should study history. Roger, and you know, as we say, if you don't study it, you're doomed to repeat it. And we, <laughs> Very we, true. We, we Very seem true. to be repeating a lot of things. <laughs> All right, guys, and uh, a, stay tuned, nautiluslive.org. All Take right, care, guys. Thank you. Take care, Bob. Take care. Thanks, Sam, my daughter. Thanks, Jeff. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.